Good morning. This is Norco Christian Church Worship Online for the first Sunday of 2021. This is January the 3rd. I am so glad to have you join us today. I am going to begin continuing my series of messages through the book of Hebrews, beginning at chapter 11, where I left off before the holiday seasons last year. The gospel according to Hebrews from a cowboy's perspective. What does a cowboy do when he is surrounded by vigilant fears? We're going to be talking about that subject as we consider the walls of Jericho today. We're glad to have you with us. God bless you. And we'll begin our service here in just a moment. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege to gather in your name and to praise you and to ask you to bless our lives. Most of all, Lord, to give us strength and power to follow your will, to follow your word, to become knowledgeable about your word and to allow you to guide and direct our lives. So Lord, we have come together to be encouraged, to be strengthened, and to be motivated to live for you. Lord, we ask that your presence might be with us now as we share these moments together. For it is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. It is so good to have you here today. We have uh, a lot of people missing for various reasons, um, one of which is COVID-19. <laughs> we have a couple of families that are missing because they know they've been exposed. They're not sick yet that they know of, but uh, they are being cautious and not being here because during the Christmas holidays, they had some of their other family who evidently did test positive. So we have a couple of families that are gone because of that. So uh, we, I appreciate so much your being here today. And so let's sing together our next hymn of praise. I've got a mansion over the hilltop. Where the ransom will shine 
where you are. <laughs> communion time to share around the table of the Lord and to remember his great gift to us, the gift of his life that we might know and have the hope of eternal life and be able to say, I'm happy on my way to heaven. Let's stand as we prepare our hearts and our minds for a word of prayer and then we invite you to partake of your communion. Once again, if you have not picked your communion up at the back, you may do that during the singing of the song and take it any time during the song. You feel free to do so as we sing at Calvary. Lord, thank you for the health we do have and we pray for all who, are, who need healing. We thank you for our country, our families, and our friends. We pray that we will reflect your image to those we know and to those we don't know. Lord, we pray that the spiritual as well as the physical needs of the homeless will be met. Lord, thank you in this new year that through the power of prayer, we are able to have hope. Jesus, we pray that groups such as Focus on the Family, are able to make judicial progress in advancing pro-life beliefs. We pray that all government leaders will see the good in America's past and not try to disregard the values and principles it was based upon. Thank you for Pastor Allen's leadership, all that are, all that are a part of our church, and those who may join us in this new year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. seated. Oh, let me say thank you. Thank you for being here. 
On this, the first Sunday of 2021, all of you can gloriously say you have been here every Sunday of 2021. <laughs> ah, it's great to begin a new year. And we with who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord. Our theme for 2021, I will get into the theme scripture later in a week or so. But today, I want to continue with, and over the next few weeks, finish my series through the book of Hebrews. I have not forgotten about the rest of that book, uh, but I took some time off during the holidays to uh, preach from more current uh, calendar events. And so, um, before I get too far away from the book, I do want to take some time to finish that. There is a, still a lot to cover. Even in chapter 11, if I did it thoroughly, um, and I'm still not sure how thorough I'm going to get into that, I, I was reading it over several times this week and thinking, wow, there, uh, the writer of Hebrews covers a great deal of history uh, in that one chapter just by mentioning names. And so uh, we will, I, I want to take some time to uh, glean some lessons from those characters because the the writer of Hebrews is telling us that we are surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses, but if those witnesses don't mean anything to us, how can they encourage us? And so I want you to get acquainted with those people, and so that's why I'm taking some time to do so. So let's get right into our scripture today, Hebrews 11, verse 1, because this is the foundation of all that comes after it. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Now when he says we believe by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command does not mean that there is no evidence for that. Faith is based on evidence. Now, let's go down to the very, uh, or to the 30th verse, because I have preached through the first 29 verses. If you miss those, you can pick them up on Norco Christian Church Worship Online on YouTube. So, uh, <clears throat> Hebrews 11, verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Now, I will pick up the rest of this passage in future sermons. I just do not have time to read all of this this morning. I, I, as I prepared my sermon, I had three points. And then after I got finished with my first point, I decided that already was too long for one sermon. So you're going to get the first point with three lessons from it. Uh, so, what does a cowboy do when he is surrounded by vigilant peers? He finds ways to emulate their vigilance. Our cowboy has put in long days and cold nights keeping watch over a large herd of cattle out on the open range. The days get long, they get long because he is the only one to keep himself company. There is no one to talk to but himself. The day can get long under those conditions, but there is 
one very positive force in, it, in his life. He is surrounded by vigilant peers, even in his isolation. His father and grandfather before him were vigilant and resilient cowboys before him. When the days get long and the nights get cold, there is one powerful element of encouragement to keep him riding his family tree. His family tree surrounds him. His father and grandfather have traveled that path before him. Now what would he do in the face of trying times? The real question, I suppose, would be what would we do when we understand that we are surrounded by vigilant peers? Vigilant peers of faith. Here in Hebrews 11, God surrounds us with vigilant peers. The first thing that we do to emulate the vigilance of our spiritual peers is to obey God even when the outcome seems improbable. That's what the walls of Jericho are all about. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. The people of Israel believed God and obeyed his instructions even when the outcome seemed improbable. <clears throat> for some of you, the story of Jericho is so familiar that you need no reminder of the biblical facts that go with that city. For others, you may need some reminder. You may not remember or know much about it, but for the sake of this sermon this morning, it is important that I remind every one of us of the facts that make the city of Jericho and the people of Israel so important. The story of Jericho is one of the spiritual highlights of Israel's experience with God partly because they were still following his word, his instructions. Joshua is about to lead the Israelites across the Jordan River. They were ready to march into the land of Canaan, a land that God had promised they would inherit if they were obedient to him. But before they crossed the river, Joshua knew there was a barrier that would keep them from going very far, and that was the city of Jericho. So Joshua appointed a couple of spies to go spy out the land, and especially the city of Jericho. So the two spies forded the river of Jordan at flood season and went to the city of Jericho. And lo and behold, you would not believe it, but they found shelter and safety in the middle of the town in a very unlikely place, in the house of a Jericho prostitute by the name of Rahab. We will talk more about Rahab later because her name is also listed in this list of famous faithful in Hebrews 11. Eventually, these spies were able to return to the Israelite camp and inform Joshua about the conditions they faced on the road ahead. And this is what, Joshua, uh, what the spies told Joshua. This is going to be a breeze. Because the people in this land have heard the stories of how God helped us across the Red Sea. And what happened to the Egyptian armies? And the people are melting, is the word they used. The people are melting at the thought of our presence. And so God works another miracle and causes the Jordan River to stop before their very eyes as the water piles up before them at the flood stage of the year, and the people once again walk across the dry ground. 
And so the scripture says in Joshua, the third chapter, beginning in verse 1, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out on their way to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. And then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance. Does that term sound familiar? <laughs> you see, social distancing isn't a new idea. It is as old as the word of God. <laughs> and some of these young whippersnappers thought they were really telling us something. Huh? <laughs> Keep a distance, and, and not just six feet, about 3,000 feet is what God says. Stay, stay away from that ark. Keep a distance of about 3,000 feet between you and the ark. Do not go near it. If you do, it'll be worse than COVID. And Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things among you. And then in verse, verse 14 of Joshua 3, the scripture says, So the people broke camp to cross the Jordan. The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing it piled up in a heap a great distance away. It was highly improbable at that season of the year especially that the Jordan River at flood time was going to disappear before their very eyes. But it did. Because they obeyed God, even when the outcome seemed improbable. And so the second lesson I want you to see in this incident of the Israelites and their leader, Joshua, is that when we obey God, we will know which way to go. Even if the outcome seems improbable. God told them that he would lead them into this new land so that they would know which way to go since they had never been that way before. It is somewhat like the here ahead of us. We have not been this way before. Every year is new. Every year will present its challenges. Every year will give us new experiences, some of which are enjoyable and glorious, and some of which will challenge our soul. But the thing that God wants us to know is that if we follow his lead, if we follow his word, if we follow his guidance, then we will know which way to go, even though we have never been this way before. That is the ultimate secret of the Christian's hope and experience. We view the world from a different worldview because we can trust the guidance of God. We can trust that we know which way to go even though we have not been this way before. Obeying God is always the right way to go. <clears throat> Even when the outcome seems improbable, we can know which way to go 
even though we have never been this way before when we trust God. There are more interesting facts in the Bible account of the crossing of the Jordan River, which I do not have time to recount for you this morning, but you can read them in the fourth chapter of the book of Joshua if you wish. But after several days and several other experiences, Joshua is faced with another interesting experience. In Joshua 5, verse 13, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? And the man replied, Neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord I have come. And then Joshua fell down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does the Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. And then in the sixth chapter, verse 1, the scripture says Jericho, Jericho was now tightly shut up because... Of the Israelites, not because of COVID-19. No one went in or out, and then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. Now what I, I hope you see in this experience in Joshua's life is what this man, who is, I think, obviously an angel, says to jo Joshua, when Joshua asks, are you for us or for our enemies? And the angel answered, neither. The, an uh, the angel answered, I'm not on either side. And then the angel says that he is commander of what? The Lord's army. You see, the question is not whose side is God on. The question we need to ask is, are we on God's side? <clears throat> for maybe both sides are wrong and God isn't really for either one of us. And so we need to be on God's side. And so the third lesson we can glean from this biblical record is to ask the question, are we on God's side? Joshua answered that question by falling, da falling down and bowing in reverence to God. We know that we are on God's side when we obey him even when the outcome seems improbable. Then God gives Joshua instructions about how the Israelites are to respond to the tight security of the walled city of Jericho. What happens next is the Israelites do exactly as God instructs them. They march around the city without a shout, with no noise at all except the blowing of trumpets made out of ram's horns. The priest blew those trumpets as they marched in front of the Ark of the Covenant, also carried by the priest and guarded by the armed guard. They marched all the way around the city, which from archaeological expeditions may not have been all that far. 
But the point is, they followed God's instructions. They did this on the first day, and the second day, and the third day, and the fourth day, and the fifth day, and the sixth day. Until they had marched all the way around the city for six days in a row. Then in the sixth chapter of Joshua, verse 17, the scripture says, On the seventh day they got up at daybreak and marched around the city in the same manner, except on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the, the people, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. And when the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. They were victorious because they obeyed God in spite of the fact that the outcome seemed improbable. Now, the archaeological evidence for the city of Jericho, Jericho is overwhelming. We know at one time in history there was a city of Jericho. Jericho was an oasis in the middle of a rather large desert. Because there was, and still is to this very day, a spring at one end of the city that supplied water for the whole town. There have been several well-known archaeological studies of the city over the last hundred years, plus most of which were done to try to prove that the Bible account is just a mythological story and not true historical fact. It is interesting to me that the unbelieving world literally recognizes the evidence and want to do their best to make sure that the rest of the world doesn't believe it. So let's set out to show the evidence is in error. One of those excavations took place between the years of 1907 to 1911. A German excavation was carried out, and they concluded after their excavations and studies that Jericho's walls were not standing during the time that the Israelites came to town. This excavation took place during a period of time before pottery chronology was well developed, so their dating was far off the mark. But later, Watzinger, one of the excavation leaders, revised his chronology but still concluded that Jericho was unoccupied during the time that the Israelites would have first appeared in Canaan. And then... In the 1930s, a British archaeologist by the name of Garstang questioned the results of the German expedition and mounted an expedition of his own to go f uh, gather further evidence regarding the date of the fortifications of Jericho. Garstang was the first investigator to use modern archaeological methods at the site in short, because I don't have time to give you all of the details, Garstang concluded that indeed the city of Jericho was occupied and fortified during the time that the Israelites came to town. But Garstang's conclusions precipitated a lot of controversy from his colleagues. And so in the 1950s, another British archaeologist by the name of Kathleen Kenyon headed up another campaign at the ruins of Jericho. Her findings were almost entirely based on what she did not discover rather than on what she did 
discover. What she did not find <coughs> was a certain type of expensive pottery that would have dated the time as being the period in which the Israelites' presence were in the land of Canaan. But because that pottery did not exist in her excavations, she concluded that, that there was no wall to fall at the time that Joshua came. And so the story of the Bible is myth and fiction. Most unbelieving archaeologists of today point to Kathleen Kenyon's conclusions as evidence that the Bible is not true and cannot be trusted for authenticity. After all, if Jericho can be proven to be a myth, then the rest of the scripture must be also. The problem with Kathleen Kenyon's findings is that she found the absence of expensive pottery in an impoverished part of the city of Jericho. Surprise, surprise. It is not likely that you would find expensive pottery in very poorest parts of any village. Kathleen Kenyon died in 1978 before many of her findings could be published, and her detailed findings were never published. In the spring of 1997, two Italian archaeologists conducted a limited excavation on the ancient tell of Jericho, and after their excavation, these archaeologists announced that they found no evidence for a destruction from the time of Joshua, and so it must be true. Three excavations have concluded that the biblical story of the walls of Jericho must be a myth. But here's the problem with almost every one of those excavations. First, they were done with a bias in their approach. Not one of them wanted to find positive evidence. The leaders of three of the four excavations began with the assumption that Joshua would have entered the country of Canaan long after the date of the archaeological city of Jericho. And that the, Jer and that the city was not even occupied when Joshua came. And then the second thing that is important for us to understand is there's almost always, almost always an argument about dating for biblical events between scholars who believe the Bible and those who don't. It is often accepted that those on the unbelieving side are correct. The reason for that is if the dates between the archaeological findings and the biblical events fell into agreement, then all of the other facts, all of the other evidence would automatically fall in place, and then what would I have to do? I would have to believe it. And here is what we find in the archaeological excavations from every one of those four expeditions. And this information can be confirmed by Dr. Bryant Wood, a current biblical archaeologist and creationist. The first and the most obvious evidence from the archaeological excavations is that the walls of Jericho indeed did fall down. The archaeological evidence shows that. Every one of the expeditions proved that. Second, they fell down in such a way that they were not pushed or battered inward as a military pursuit. They fell as if an earthquake had caused them to fall and thus would have easily allowed a pursuing army to climb over the rubble and enter the city. 
And a third very interesting piece of evidence is that there is a part of the wall in the ruins of the old Jericho that did not fall. It is still standing to this day. Why do you suppose that may have been? Was it just random? Or may it well be that the part of the wall that still stands today was the part of the wall of the house of Rahab? The Bible tells us in Joshua 2, verse 15, when the spies came to spy out the city of Jericho and she hid them in her house and then she allowed them to to escape out her window. How could they escape out her window? The scripture says, so, so she let them down by a rope through the window for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. We know that the spies promised Rahab that Israel would spare the lives of her and her family if she brought them into the house and were not out in the streets of Jericho when they came to destroy the city. They could not be saved by going out of the house. They had to stay inside. That's what the, the, uh, the spies told her. How else then could Rahab's family have been saved except that God kept the part of the wall protected where her house resided? And so the dating process for archaeology is almost always an issue. And in almost every case, the dating issue is the only problem. and usually can be harmonized in favor of the biblical account. All the rest of the evidence is there. It is obviously the city, obvious that the city of Jericho existed. The Bible didn't make that up. The walls of Jericho fell, and unusually so. The Bible didn't make that up. And a portion of the wall is still standing in spite of the unusual calamity of the fallen walls. All the rest of the evidence is there. But if we can somehow show that the city of Jericho had already fallen when Joshua came, then we can conclude that the Bible story is only a myth. But the evidence for the Bible stories being true is always there. In every case, if you want to have reason to believe, if you do not want to believe, there is always an argument for a way out. But the evidence still stares you in the face. If you are looking for an improbable outcome, then obey God. Let me conclude my message today by reminding you that the point I want to make with emphasis this morning is that like Joshua and the Israelites, at this point in history, they still obeyed God even though the outcome seemed improbable. There were three events in this story that illustrates their faith. The first was the crossing of the Jordan River at flood season. Bryant Wood says he believes that it's very possible that a large earthquake occurred to cause the Jordan River to dam and allow the Israelites to cross in such an impossible uh, uh, time of year. Um, because that very same thing has happened in recent history. Today, the Jordan River doesn't have a lot of water in it by the time it reaches the Dead Sea. The current inhabitants of the land use 
much of the water for irrigation before it has opportunity to become a furious flood at flood time, at harvest time nowadays. But when the priests of the Lord carried the Ark of the Covenant into the Jordan River, they had to trust, they had to have faith, they had to obey God even though the outcome seemed improbable. It was not naturally probable that the Jordan River was going to just vanish beneath their feet. But they obeyed God anyway. The second thing that illustrates the outstanding faith of these people is that they just did what God told them to do even though the outcome seemed improbable. Marching around a fortified city with walls in some places as high as 40 feet according to some excavations and as thick as 6 feet. How could marching around those walls allow them to enter the city? The conclusion was highly improbable. Now God had told Joshua what was going to happen by the end of the seventh day. He told Joshua that the walls would collapse. But only by blowing horns and marching feet and carrying an ark around the city 13 times in a week. There wasn't a probable chance that the walls were going to fall, but they obeyed God anyway, even though the outcome seemed improbable. There will often be times in our lives that doing, God's, doing things God's way seems the improbable way to accomplish things, many things in our life. Our problem is that we just like being in control. And God wants us to let him be in control. And so if we are going to see the great things God can do, we have to let him be in control. Because when we let God be in control of our life, the outcome will be much better than when we are. Obey God even when the outcome seems improbable, for only then can we see his hand at work. And the third event was when Joshua met the man with the sword and asked, Whose side are you on? Wrong question. The question is to understand that God isn't on anybody's side. The need is that we are on his. When the, when the most improbable things in life begin to happen to us, what we need to do is reflect the image of God, for we are surrounded by vigilant peers. It is invitation time. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you that you've surrounded us with many examples of your powerful hand and those who have followed you even when the outcome seemed improbable. And we pray, Lord, that we might have faith to follow you for we know that we can know which way to go because you have given us instructions even though we have never been this way before. So Lord, as we look forward to the year ahead, I pray that you might guide us and strengthen us and help us to have faith to trust you and obey you in spite of the fact that the outcome seems improbable there is any here today who needs to come and place their faith in you, I pray that this might be that time for them to come. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have a decision to make for Christ, we invite you to come as we stand and sing together, I Found Happiness.
may be seated. First of all, let me say thank you again for being here. I know our attendance is down today because we have so many people that are staying home and being careful as I have asked you to do so that we don't infect others. That's a, a good thing. Uh, at the same time, it, it creates a, a hole in our attendance, doesn't it? But thank you so much. The only thing that we have coming up that I think I need to remind you about is this Saturday is men's prayer breakfast. So that's still going on, right? Yep. Okay. Men's prayer breakfast this Saturday at 8 o'clock. So keep that in mind. Then also, um, Wednesday evening Bible study will resume in February, February the 3rd. So keep that in mind, the first February, uh, the first Wednesday of February at 6 o'clock as we continue our study in cold case Christianity. Uh, the evidence of uh, this time will be more evidence about the scripture. We, t we talked to the evidence about the universe and about life and science and that kind of thing in our first session. Uh, our second session will be more evidence kind of stuff that I was giving you today. So uh, we hope that you will join us for that. And if you are not able to be here, uh, once again, you can watch the service online. Thank you to these guys for watching our cameras so that you can uh, be able to do that and uh, give me more work to do. <laughs> 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 okay, let's stand and sing together, leaning on the everlasting arms. week.